Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of T-Dog RC and uh, this is part two of how to learn how to fly your first RC plane and in this case with part two what we're going to be doing today is uh, learning how to assemble and build and set up your first RC plane. So if you're not seeing part one which I'll put a link up here to part one um, then in that one we were talking about choosing your first RC plane uh, and we went through choosing something like this which is uh, a Hobby King Bixler or something similar to that where it's kind of a glider style model. Um, so in, in this part as I've said we're going to get stuck into actually getting it put together ready to fly. Um, so without further ado let's get stuck in. Right then, so um, let's get stuck into this uh, assembly and build of our first RC plane. So what I've gone and done is um, I've gone and downloaded the instructions and printed them out. Um, so this is the uh, instruction manual for the Bixler 3. Um, the, you don't get one in the box and that's common for quite a few models, um, but you can usually find um, a link to download it from the vendor's website. Um, or of course you can just view it on your phone, which to be honest is what I would normally do, but in this case I've decided to download and print this one out. And what I would always recommend you do before you get stuck into actually putting this thing together, um, although you know you might be quite excited, etc., because it's your first first time you've done one, um, but just take the time to have a read through the manual from start to finish, just to familiarize yourself with the process, because um, it's quite easy to do something um, because you think it's the right way of doing it, but then you realize that before you did that, you should have done something else. And now you've glued that particular piece in place, which means the other thing isn't gonna, you're not gonna be able to do it. So that's something that can catch you out. So um, I'd uh, recommend having a look through this. It's, there's, the instructions on this are really simple. It's a nice, easy um, plane to put together. There's just a few steps to go through here to, to assemble it. Um, but obviously this doesn't go through things like setting your radio gear up and all that sort of stuff, uh, which I'm going to be talking about as well as part of this. Um, it gives you some uh, warnings about charging a LiPo battery and then importantly it shows you how to check that you've got everything moving in the right direction once you've got everything connected and you've got your receiver set up, etc. Those sorts of things, um, we could have a quick look at those towards the end of this video, but we'll also cover those on the part three, which is going to be uh, the first flight of your RC plane. Um, it also has an accessory section here so you know um, the parts that should come with your plane. So it's got a photo of what's in the box. In terms of uh, tools and things like that you're going to need, um, basic stuff really. I know for a fact that uh, this plane does need some glue um, in order to uh, assemble it. So a um, couple of things you're going to need you might want to get yourself a hobby knife or scalpel like this. Um, these are fairly common um, in the UK. Seem to use a lot of swan mort and stuff. Um, I think uh, in America they, they're called exacto knives, but they're all very similar. So something like that is ideal. A pair of long nose pliers, always handy. Uh, a decent sort of precision screwdriver set because often a lot of the sort of screws and bolts that you're working with are pretty small. Um, so, you, you know, a normal screwdriver might be a little bit too big. So get hold of a, a precision screwdriver set. This will come in really handy. Even if you only need one of these attachments, uh, I can assure you that uh, once you get into the hobby going forward, you'll, you'll end up using all of these and this will be invaluable. And then in terms of glue, uh, one of the things I always use when I'm gluing foam models is foam tack. Um, this is readily available on Amazon and places like that. Um, this is really good glue, it's specifically designed for working with foam uh, models uh, and it will glue foam, bolts, uh, carbon fibre, all that sort of stuff. Um, if you can't get hold of this then another good option is um, something like Yoohoo Pour which is a bit more common to find. Um, both of these are contact adhesives so what that means is you put the glue on to both surfaces you then get the two surfaces together and then pull them apart again. So you make that initial contact, pull them apart. Sometimes you might want to do that a few times and with foam tack it gets really stringy. And when you see all the strings, that's when you know you're in a, a good place with it. And then once you've done that a couple of times, so just pull it back and forth like that and then leave it uh, then for uh, a few minutes, probably sort of four minutes or so. And then you join them together again for the last time. And when you do that last join, that it's going to stick 
and stick permanently. So it's actually quite fast glue to use. You know, you don't have to wait hours for it to dry and it really is a good bond for, for foam. So definitely recommend something like that. Okay, so what we'll do is I'll flip the camera up to the top of the bench and we'll have a look at uh, starting the uh, assembly. Right then, so first job, according to the assembly guide, is, uh, in fact, I'll, I'll move it out of the way, because the first thing we've got to do is glue the vertical and horizontal stabiliser together. So that's the vertical stabiliser, that's the horizontal stabiliser, also known as, obviously that's the rudder and that's the elevator. So let's get these open. Careful not to cut into the foam, of course. And one of the things you always want to do with a foam uh, model is flex the hinges like this. Because when you first get these, you know, they're fresh out of the mould and fresh out of the, uh, the factory. And um, the hinge line here is often pretty stiff. And if you don't flex it like that, and you'll feel it sort of loosen up. Um, it can damage your servo if you just connect it straight up and don't do that. You can burn the servo out, particularly if you've got uh, plastic geared servos, which they probably will be in this model. So just do that a few times. Um, same for, for everything that, uh, all the surfaces that move. This one's actually not too bad, but um, nevertheless, we'll still do it just to be on the safe side. So what it actually says with this one is that we need to install the um, vertical stabilizer onto here before we put this into the fuselage. And this is an example of where you might go and stick this onto the fuselage first and then realize that you need to uh, fasten the vertical stabilizer to it before you did that. So, um, and it says that uh, we just do that by gluing these two together uh, here. So to you do that, I'm gonna use a bit of foam tack and I'll show you how we use this. Some foam tack to this area here which is where the two surfaces are going to meet. Fairly decent amount. And the thing with foam tack is uh, it's one of those sort of things where it doesn't stop coming out once you've uh, squoze the tube. It's a bit of a delayed reaction. So I just wait for a few minutes and it should hopefully eventually stop. If it doesn't, just give it a wipe and get the lid on. If you don't get the lid on it, it'll continue just to sort of come out. Okay, so we've got the foam tack on there. So as I mentioned at the start, we're just gonna join these two uh, surfaces together, give them a good push, and then we're gonna pull them apart. Gonna do that a few times. And you, yeah, I don't know whether you can pick that up on the camera, um, but you can sort of see that there's a kind of string forming there between the two, um, like fiber almost. And that's a good thing. Um, so I've done that a few times, so I can put that to one side, leave that for five minutes or so, and then uh, it'll uh, be ready to stick together. Okay, they've had a few minutes to go tacky. So now I'm gonna go for the final joint, push it into place, give it a good press, and that's, sorted. Now obviously with a bit of force I could quite I could quite easily just pull that apart but it is immediately pretty strong so you know I'm pulling quite hard there and it's 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 solid so as you can see I only left that probably three four minutes and it does form a very strong bond very quickly so it's quite a good glue to use because um, you can get building pretty fast. So there we are that's the horizontal and vertical stabiliser joined together. So next step, we've got to get these two onto the fuselage. So, let's grab the fuselage. Let's just do a quick dry run first, see how it goes in. Now, this is quite nice because there is a lip on here. So it does kind of just lock into place um, and push in like that. So it's quite a nice join. You will find on some models that uh, maybe are a little bit cheaper, that they won't have little features like that with a tab on and stuff, and it will just be a straight uh, surface to surface join, but um, um, you know, just requires a bit more care when you're gluing it. Um, but that, you know, that's fine. So yeah, that's how that's gonna go. So let's take it off 
So we know based on that, we want glue basically in this area here and all in here as well, because that's where we're going to be joining these circuits together. So back with the foam tack again. And let's get the glue in here as before. Plenty of glue in here because you don't want this coming off during flight, otherwise that would be a disaster. Okay, so happy with that. And then we're going to do the same thing again. So we're going to join these two together a few times. And when you do this as well, you are spreading the uh, foam tack or the glue about a bit as well. So it's not all just in blobs. Um, so it's creating like an even spread of the glue. And that's starting to get pretty tight already. So I'll give it one more of those. And then as you can see, same again, loads of fibres there coming off the glue, so that's great. Reminds me of Gremlins a bit, if you can remember that. Um, yeah, so I'll leave that set for a minute. Right, let's go for it then. There we go, that's nicely uh, nicely attached on there. Good stuff. Okay, so next on the instructions is to set the landing gear up. Let's put that there carefully. Um, and it talks you through putting the wheel pants on. Um, so these things, um, you glue these on. They just glue onto those plastic tabs there. What I'd recommend you do, unless you know for sure that you're going to be flying on tarmac, I'd probably leave these off for, for the first few flights. You can always put these on um, afterwards once you've flown it a few times. But the problem with these, excuse me, is they, um, they do tend to get caught in grass quite a lot. Um, so most people will, first flight, will probably be flying this from a field or a park or something like that. So uh, I'd probably recommend leaving those off for now. So I think all we've got to do with these is literally just push this in. Okay, so on the carriage are in, um, there's no glue or anything for these, they literally just push in, but it is a bit tricky, um, particularly trying to hold the model and get them in at the same time. Um, but what I found was, uh, obviously this is gonna be different depending on what model you've got, but if you sort of hold them and bend them in slightly like that and then push in, and you wanna get it so um, you can see the metal right at the top there from the top of the fuselage and then the wheels are all the way in so that's the undercarriage on slightly tricky but you'll, you'll get there no problem so basically next we're onto the wings uh, and fastening the wings together so i'll just put this to one side for a minute starting to look like a plane now also one thing that you do want to check I should mention before the glue does go off it's just um, it's a bit hard to do on the camera this but just get the uh, you know put your face in front of the plane level and just check that the horizontal and vertical stabilizer look at uh, 90 degrees um, you know they don't have to be absolutely spot on you don't need to get a set square on them or anything like that but as long as they look about 90 degrees on a model like this that should be fine and the good thing is with this particular one because it had got those guide tabs um, it's quite hard to uh, get that wrong and in this case it's uh, pretty square but you certainly want to make sure that your tail is nice and square right so we've got the wings um, same procedure as before so um, actually i say that we can't do that they, they've already connected up the um, servo for the ailerons here so we can't flex these surfaces but actually you don't really need to on these because these have got proper hinges um, so it's only when you've got the foam hinges that you have to flex them um, we just need to remove this bit of foam that they've put over here so make sure you take that off and it is quite nice that they've um, already connected these up for us now this particular model also comes with um, the option to add flaps um, but it's not like that by default and to be honest you don't really need flaps on a model like this uh, maybe 
you know, if you want to, um, if you're a bit more advanced, then you could give the flaps a go. But certainly for um, your first flights, um, you don't need them. So just leave these alone. Don't bend these because they're fastened in place. And actually what you might want to do is uh, just put a bit of tape down this gap here to stop stop them uh, flexing in any way and, and make sure they're secure. Because actually if they do flex uh, whilst you're flying, it would cause a problem. So yeah, definitely recommend putting some tape on there. Uh, okay, so we've got the wings. And these are designed um, to be taken apart. So just need to unravel the servo lead there and on here. So on this one it's taped down because this is going to go uh, inside the fuselage. So in order to join the wings together we've got the aluminium bar which is supplied in the uh, in the box. So that goes into this tube here like that and then into the other side Tight fit on that side, there we go. Uh, and now the nice thing about the this Bixler 3 is actually it has got this sort of quick connect. So uh, the servo leads want to be hanging out the bottom. Um, and then basically we just push these together and it should clip into place once everything is lined up. Okay, so that's clipped in. It was a little bit tight, I just had to lift this tab up. Um, I think there's no sort of click, but I'm pretty sure that's that's clicked in. Uh, and these are quite good because they're kind of quick. Um, you know, they're not a solid uh, piece, so obviously they're quite big, and so it makes it a little easier to transport because you just unclip that and then pull them apart, which is good. Uh, I'm just going to take this bit of foam off here as well, which is a bit tricky now. I've got them joined together. Okay, let's get the fuselage and let's get the wings on. So, the servo leads are just going to go inside there like that. To turn this round so I can actually get it on. It's obviously pretty big wingspan, so it's a bit tricky on the bench. Um, then you've got this tab here, which is going to hook into there. Like that. Servo leader in the way. There we go. So it literally just pushes in like that. And then we've got these two retaining. Um, they're not bolts, they're like a, a clip. I'll, I'll show you. So these are in the little accessory pack that you get. Um, so they just look like that. So they're not threaded or anything. They've just got that catch on the end there. So we're going to slide those in. And then should twist it around like that. And that locks it into place. Nice little system actually because it's um, easy to take to bits to put it in your car and easy to assemble when you get to the field. Uh, and that's it. The wings are on, the tail's on. It really is looking like a plane. I know you can't quite see it all there in the camera but let me uh, zoom that back a bit. But yeah, she's starting to look like a plane. I really do like the colours of this uh, Bixler as well. It's uh, It really does stand out nicely. So we've done that. Now that's the basic assembly done. All we've got to do now is sort of fiddly bits. So we've got to connect up the rear uh, control surfaces. So we've got to con connect the control links um, to the servos. The servos are all pre-installed, but we've got to fasten um, the push rods and control links to the horns which are on the back of the vertical stabilizer and the horizontal stabilizer So uh, let's take a look at that next Okay, so we've got the surfaces 
fastened on. So the next thing we need to do is connect up the clevises, which are these things. So that's a clevis and we need to connect that to the control horns, which uh, on this model, they've already installed the control horns for us, which is, uh, which is good because sometimes you have to put these on yourself. Um, if you do have to put these on yourself, um, then you want to make sure that they're a really nice secure fit and maybe even put a blob of glue on the underside to make sure it's um, it's nice and secure because the last thing you want is the clevises um, popping off because that would uh, end in disaster basically. Looking at these, it does look like Hobby King have actually put a little bit of glue on these already to secure them, so that's good. So what we do really to connect the clevis up is it's just got a little pin on it and we just open it up and um, connect it into the hole of the control horn and uh, that should be ready to go. The only thing I would recommend is once you've got these um, clips on to the control horn, you push them together, I'll show you in a second, and they'll, they'll clip in and clip shut. But it's always a good idea to put something on there to um, to secure it, uh, just in case it, it was to come open while you're flying. Again, that would be a, a major issue. Now what I use, and I appreciate if you're a beginner, it's very unlikely you're going to have this, but I use a piece of silicon fuel tube from a nitro engine and just cut a tiny little piece off and uh, just put like a feed that over the top there to form like a band and that just keeps it secure and stops it, any risk of it popping off. But if you haven't got any fuel tube, then you could use maybe a bit of insulation tape, just cut a thin thin piece and just wrap it around there nice and tight once you've got it connected to the control horn or something like that but just try and use something just to secure it a little bit better what we also before we um, fasten these on the servos are here on this uh, uh, this Bixler so they're actually uh, they're actually mounted inside the fuselage if I take the lid off you can sort of see them here um, so there's no way we could ever get to those so it's good that hobby king have already mounted the uh, servo horns on there because there's no way we can get to them um, but what we want to do is is make sure that the servos are centered before we connect them up to the surface and a great way to do that you could connect it up to your radio um, and center them that way but a really good bit of kit is to get one of these which is just a little servo tester uh, these are really cheap and you can get them from pretty much any hobby website or any model shop uh, and you plug a battery into one end I'm just going to plug that into here make sure I've got it the right way around oops try again okay and then it's got three different options on this which you just cycle through uh, option one is manual mode so if I turn this it will move the server Option two is neutral, which is the one I need to use, so that will centre the servo. And then the third one is a, like a, a windscreen wiper mode, if you like. It's an auto mode that um, just pulses the servo backwards and forwards. So I'm going to put it in uh, neutral mode. And then I'm just going to get the appropriate servo lead and connect that up. And again, making sure we get it the right way around. It does tell us on here. And you probably didn't pick that up on camera, but there's a very slight... Uh, movement there of the server so that means really it's pretty much centered which is good um, if you hear it move a lot then it means that it's that it uh, wasn't centered so we'll just do this one as well and that one's the same so uh, pretty much both of those are centered quite nicely so that's that done okay so what we're going to do now then is we're just going to get the control horn and just clip this on thread it through like that and before you clip this in you want to make sure that the surface is pretty central so obviously if when you connect the the control horn up if if like the elevators up like that when you've got the control horn connected then you need to adjust this clevis by either winding it in or winding it out the only thing you need to watch out for is that you don't wind it out so much that you've, you've almost wound it off the thread um, because then it wouldn't be very secure because it might pop off the, uh, the the metal push rod. But that's highly unlikely on a model like this because they, they would have already preset these for you. And as you can see on this one, 
it's the threads going all the way through the clevis and actually out the other side a little bit so i know for sure there that this clevis is is well threaded onto the rod and uh, and as i would expect because hobby king have kind of set this up for us it's pretty much bang on in terms of uh, where we want it to be i'm trying to do this without So yeah, again, just eyeball this, make sure that you're happy with that. For me, that's that's fine. That's the, the elevator's pretty uh, horizontal to the stabiliser there, so that's good. So we can click this together. I'm not gonna click it just, well, I will do, I suppose, for the camera. I was gonna just put the fuel tube on, but I'll do that in a minute off camera. So you just clip it together like that. It makes a click and that's now secured on there. Uh, and if I get my servo tester plugged back in now, And I'll change it to manual mode now. Put this up. So now I'm just going to turn the little uh, knob on this. Um, I've got it in manual mode now. Um, so when I turn this, you can hear the servo moving. And if I get the tailplane into shot, you can see that that's moving quite nicely now. So that's good. And then we just need to repeat the process for the rudder. So let's get that done. Okay, and this is a good example then. I've just hooked up the rudder uh, control rod and uh, the clevis. And you can see here that in the neutral position, it's actually quite a way out, which I'm, I'm quite surprised at actually. Um, we, we need to uh, bring the rudder back this way. So that means we need to shorten the control rod. So the way to do that, is uh, I haven't got any access to the servo because of the position it's in. Um, so my only option is to uh, wind this clevis in uh, to, to make it a bit shorter. So I'm just going to take it back off and, and then just, just wind this in, you know, like you were screwing it in. So we'll give it a few turns because it's quite a, quite a way out. Okay, so we're about there now with the rudder. Um, the only thing is this has got a tail wheel um, and that tail wheel is slightly out as you can, you might be able to pick up there on the camera so it's sort of angled over this way a little bit. So I just need to push the tail wheel back. Uh, now I could wind the clevis in on, on the tail wheel um, but that's already fairly well wound in. So what I'm going to do, they've got this little collet here with a grub screw in it. Um, so I'm just going to uh, loosen that off and then just pull that straight uh, and that should sort it. So if I just get an Allen key in here, loosen this off a bit. Okay. And then just should be able to straighten this up. Oh, yeah, there we go. That's, that's pretty straight like that, I think. Okay, and then we'll hold that in position there and just tighten this back up. And there we are. Tail wheel's nice and straight in line with the rudder now. So uh, that's those connected up. Um, you notice I've still not got the prop on. I won't put the prop on until the very, very end. So I'm going to get the radio gear installed next. That's that's the next job. Uh, we don't need to do the air on uh, clevises because they've um, already been done for us. Um, so next step is to get my receiver in here and get the radio set up and make sure that's all working. Uh, and of course, I can test the motor without having to put the propeller on. So test that the motor's working, it's responding to the throttle because as I've mentioned a few times, you don't want to put the prop on um, unless you really, really have to when you've got it on your bench because it can be, you know, if you catch the throttle and uh, the motor starts going and you've got your fingers anywhere near the prop, you'll end up with a pretty serious injury. And in fact, I was watching a YouTube video the other day of someone who did a hand launch of um, an E-Flight Flying Wing Optera, I think it's called, and uh, he made a real mess of his finger, um, really nasty. He had three massive cuts down to the tendons 
So, you know, these things are pretty dangerous if you don't treat them with a bit of respect. Um, so yeah, always leave the prop off until right at the end. Obviously, just before you take it to the field, you do want to put the prop on just to check that it's spinning the right way and uh, you're not going to be um, going backwards down the runway. So um, I'm just going to get the fuel tube uh, put onto these. So I'll get that done off camera and then I'll come back uh, when that's been done just to show you. Uh, and then we're on to installing the radio gear. Okay, so it's a little bit fiddly, but um, you can see there I have got the fuel tubing over the clevis. I actually ended up having to take the clevis off and and, and uh, slide it on from the from the back because um, it's a bit tricky. And same for the uh, elevator one there. So that will just stop the clevis from springing open mid-flight. Um, so as I say, you could maybe use a little bit of tape or something like that if you haven't got uh, any fuel tubing knocking around. Um, so next stage then, which we'll get onto now, is installing the receiver into the model and setting up the transmitter with the receiver. Okay, so we're on to putting the radio gear into this now. Um, so what I've chosen with, uh, I've got a Radio Master radio, so I can, this is a multi-protocol radio, so it works with lots of different receivers. Um, but I've gone for, so I had this line around, so this is the Turner G um, i86B receiver, which is also, a, it's made by Flysky. Uh, really good receivers these are, the cheapest chips. Um, they've got um, a lot of channels on them, so they've got six channels. They also have S-Bus out, which is always handy to have, and you can plug sensors into them. In actual fact, with this particular model, uh, I'm gonna, I've am gonna i ordered a um, altitude sensor, which I'm going to plug into this so I can see um, how high I'm, I'm flying, basically. Um, but um, I'm not going to go through that for now. So I've got this bound up to my radio, so to the transmitter. Um, it's different procedures for different manufacturers of, of radio. So I'm not going to go through that procedure, but basically all I had to do with this one is um, you have to connect a special binding plug into this pin, these pins here at the end, and then go through the binding procedure on your transmitter. And when you bind the receiver to the transmitter, that makes a permanent connection between your transmitter and, and the receiver. Uh, and the idea behind that is, um, you know, no, nothing can interfere with that connection. It's it's like a unique connection between this receiver and my transmitter. Back in the old days when I used to fly, we used to use something called crystals. Um, and you used to have a crystal in your receiver and a crystal in your transmitter. And uh, I think there was about 40 or so different crystals, 1 to 40 or something like that. I can't remember the exact number. And you, you normally chose a particular number in that range and you flew all your models on crystal number 27 let's say um, and we used to have to have a peg system at the flying field so you would have to put a peg on number 27 to make sure uh, you couldn't fly until you'd taken a peg off the board and put that onto your transmitter uh, and that meant that if any, someone else went to fly um, they'd have to check the board and if peg number 27 wasn't there that means they cannot switch their transmitter on because if they did that it would interfere and cause you to crash Fortunately now with the new 2. Point, well say new it's not new anymore uh, but with the 2.4 gigahertz um, frequency uh, that is no longer an issue so you know loads of people can fly um, it doesn't matter because you make this unique link between your receiver and your transmitter and that is called binding. So this one's all bound up um, so all I need to do now is decide where I'm going to put it um, in the model so I think I'm actually going to put this here. Uh, in this space because I, I want this um, area for the battery uh, and then you've got the speed controller here so I'm actually just going to uh, install this into here um, I'm probably going to fasten it to the side like that I think that's quite neat and what you want to try and do with the uh, receiver uh, aerials is, is get them in an L shape like that so 90 degrees if you can so you want one sort of going um, horizontal uh, so in this case, this bottom one would go horizontal like that. And then I'd have this one sort of sticking up uh, like that. So it's as 90 degrees as I can I can kind of get it. Uh, but that will give you the best sort of coverage uh, when you're flying. So I'll fasten that in 
in a few minutes but um, for now what I'm going to show you is um, we've got to connect the servos up um, so I know on my receiver uh, or rather my transmitter that the channel mapping on, on, on um, my transmitter goes uh, channel one is hour on channel two is elevator channel three is throttle and channel four is rudder um, and again that may vary for your um, particular radio if you use the spectrum then it's going to be completely different um, but i think the good thing about spectrums is they actually show you on the receiver i don't think you can quite see see there so this one just says uh, channel one through to six on a spectrum it actually says elevator rudder um, uh, motor etc so you just plug in the leads to the appropriate one but i know for, for this example as i say channel one of mine is, is aileron um, which is going to be the on the wings so actually what i'm going to need for this just get this open channel one is going to be my y lead so if i get this 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 is included in the model by the way this y lead um, if you want to you could you could plug one um, air run into channel one uh, and another air run into channel five let's say and, and mix them together um, to give you the right the differential but um to keep things simple i'm just going to use a y lead so i'm going to plug that into channel one um it's going to go in like this uh, and my aileron leads will plug into there and then this side so this servo here is connected to the elevator so that one on my so not uh, my radio is going to be channel two so i'm going to plug that in there and then the throttle, so that's coming from the speed controller, is going to be channel three. So I'm going to plug that into there. And these have all got to go in. When you plug these in, they've got to be plugged in. Um, you need to just check the the uh, the right way to plug these in on your receiver. Um, so on this one, um, negatives at the bottom, positives in the middle, and then the signal. Uh, is at the top it will again it will vary for different receivers but they usually say on them uh, which way they go um, and you shouldn't do too much damage if you get it wrong it's just that your servos won't won't work um, you do want to be a bit careful with the power lead um, this one's got um, a little safety mechanism built in so if you do get the polarity wrong it's not going to do it any harm but that might not be the case for your receiver so just be aware of that when you go to plug the power one in which in this case is the throttle cable because the power comes through the speed controller um, that, that's another good thing to mention actually at this stage um, so when you're using a lipo battery with a speed controller Pretty much all speed controllers these days will have what's called a, uh, a BEC, which is a battery eliminator circuit. And what this does, um, the receiver only needs about four volts, I think it is. Uh, yeah, so on here it says four to 6.5 volts, this one will take. Um, but the LiPo is gonna be between 11 and 12, depending on its charge rate. So if I plug that into the receiver, it would blow it because um, it's too much voltage. So what the BEC does, uh, the battery eliminator circuit is it steps the voltage down um, to uh, somewhere between 4 and 6.5 volts and it's a constant voltage as well so it doesn't fluctuate regardless of whether the battery is running out of uh, you know how whether the battery is at 12 volts or 11 volts etc um, so that's what a beck is and so the nice thing about that is it means you don't need a separate flight battery um, the only time you need a flight battery um, to power your receiver and all your servos is if you're using nitro because obviously nitros don't have a lipo pack um, or if you've maybe got a very expensive model and for, for uh, sort of fail safe reasons you want to use a separate lipo to um, the the main power for the servos and the receiver you, you might look at doing that but for something like this uh, using the lipo and a beck is is absolutely perfect so that's that so okay we're going to plug in the last one so this is my rudder that's going to go into channel four um, and then hopefully i'm going to get a lipo battery um, so just for this model um, you want basically one of these which is a 2200 milliamp 3s uh, and that's going to be perfect for this model um, that's what the recommendation is so i'm going to connect up the xd60 
So you'll hear there, I got three beeps. It went beep, 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 and then there was a tone. So the three beeps tell me that I have a 3S, uh, three cell battery plugged in. Obviously, if you heard four beeps, you'd have a four cell. And the reason it does that, I, I think it's just sort of a fail safe. Um, you, 4S and 3S, um, 4S is bigger than a, a 3S, but they're similar-ish in size. And you might accidentally pick up a 4S and plug that in. Um, and, and that could blow your motor up or your speed controller if it wasn't rated for uh, the, the amount of amps that you're going to put through it by accident with a 4S. So you get those beeps. So always listen for those beeps. And uh, on a model like this, you want to be listening for three beeps. And then that final tone at the end just shows you that um, or tells you that everything's OK, basically. So um, what we should see now, all being well, is if I move the elevator... You can see, hopefully on the camera there, that that's moving. I've not got the ailerons plugged in at the minute. Um, and if I move the rudder, that's also moving as well. So that's good. And if I blip the throttle, um, we you should hear the motor. So the motor's working as well, the throttle's working. So that's all good. One thing you can do um, is you can calibrate the throttle. Um, so actually, and if you calibrate the throttle, so this is calibrating the ESC to your transmitter basically, uh, and you'll know if you need to calibrate it, if when you push the throttle stick and you can actually get quite far up um, before the motor kicks in, that suggests that your um, ESC may need calibrating so it knows the movement of your throttle control. So let's see what happens with this. Okay. That's actually not bad. Um, that's pretty well calibrated, so I'll probably leave that to be honest. But if you sort of got quite far up before the motor kicked in, then um, you want to calibrate it. And to do that, you plug, uh, you unplug the battery, put the throttle into the max position. Of course, all the time you are doing this, you have to make sure you do not have a propeller um, connected to the motor. Put your model, uh, the throttle into full, then connect the battery. Uh, then you'll hear some um, different tones coming from the ESC. And again, it depends on the model of ESC, uh, which one you're looking out for. But it's usually the first tone that you hear. When you hear that, you pull the throttle back down and then you hear another series of confirmation beeps. And that'll mean that the ESC is calibrated itself. Um, but you'll need to refer to the instruction manual for your ESC to do that. And to be honest, for your first ever flight and getting into it, it's not uh, it's not 100% um necessary uh, as you can see on this i've just plugged this in um, for me that's going to get me flying and that's going to give me control of the throttle so i wouldn't worry about that too much but it's something that you might want to have a play with as you get into it a little bit more uh okay so next job is going to be to let's get the wings on uh, let's get the ailerons connected and now i'm then i'm going to go through um to show you um to check which way the surfaces are moving to make sure they're the right way. So bear with me a second while I get uh, the wings uh, connected and we'll, uh, we'll go from there. Got the wings on, got the ailerons connected to the wire lead, same procedure, so you just match the colours up, make sure you've got them the right way around, positive, negative, etc. Um, so now um, I've repositioned the camera, I've just put it on the floor in my garage here, hopefully you can see it okay there. Um, and if I move the ailerons now, they are moving, and so is the rudder, and so is the elevator. Um, now, the funny thing is, I think it's the first time I've had this happen, but usually when you connect um, your radio gear up, you'll have at least one thing that's moving in the wrong direction. Um, so let me show you what I mean by that. See if I can get the camera a little bit closer here. So let's have a look at the tail. Okay, so when I pull back, on the um, elevator stick, which is the right hand stick, and I'm going to pull back towards towards me, the elevator should go up. But as you can see here, it's going down. And if I push away from me, it's going up. And the rudder, which is on the left hand stick, this is if you mode two, which I am, so I've got the throttle on the left. When I turn the throttle, uh, sorry, when I turn the rudder to the right, the rudder should move to the right, but it's moving to the left and the air runs which are on the 
uh, right hand stick, when I move them left to right, um, they should move in opposite directions to each other. So one should go up, one should go down. But depending on which way um, you turn in, obviously it's, it's different. So if I want to bank to the right, the left aileron should go down. So actually, in this case, that is correct. So the aileron's are, are right. So when I turn, um, if I was going to bank to the right, the left aileron's going down. And if I bank to the left, the left aileron should go up. And if you think about it, if you're banking to the left, it's going to dip this wing down. And in order to do that, you need something that's going to deflect the air and cause some resistance for the wing to drop down. So that's why the left aileron goes up like that when you want to turn bank to the left. So if I was going to bank to the left, the left aileron would go up and the plane would bank over like that. So aileron's are okay, so that's fine. We don't need to do anything there, but elevator uh, and rudder are the wrong way around. So all I need to do, and again, this differs depending on what radio you've got, but I'll just show you on this anyway. So on mine, I go into the settings, page through uh, until I get to outputs. So uh, channel two is my elevator channel. So I select that, go along to, and then I've got a direction there. So that arrow is pointing that way. I just press it and it puts the arrow the other way. And then on channel four, which is the rudder, I just do the same thing. So I'll just turn the direction. And again, this is gonna be different depending on what make of uh, radio you have. But uh, there'll always be a, a direction feature where you can change the direction. So now I've done that. If I pull back uh, on the elevator stick towards me, I'm now getting up elevator, which is perfect. If I push down away from me, I'm getting down elevator. If I turn the rudder to the right, I'm getting right rudder and then left rudder the other way. So that's all working absolutely fine. So that is us done in terms of setting up the radio gear. Um, my aerons are working in the right direction, rudder and elevator working in the direction. Throttle will always work in the right direction. So that, that's, that's all good there. So next thing for me to do now is um, we need to have a look at um, the center of gravity of the model. And this is, this is very important um, because the center of gravity means where the model's gonna balance as it's flying along. And you always want a model to be slightly nose heavy. You certainly don't ever want it to be tail heavy, um, particularly not for a beginner's model like this. So always make sure that um, it's nose heavy. Okay, so on this model, and again, you check with the instruction manual, it will tell you the center of gravity in the instruction manual. And the way you measure this one is uh, we measure it from the nose and it's 334 uh, millimeters in, from this particular model, from the nose. So I wanna get my, in fact, that's the wrong ruler. So, 300, 34 is 33.4 centimeters. So uh, mark to there, that's 30 centimeters. So that's 33 there, 33.4 is gonna be about here. And actually if I feel underneath on this particular model, that is pretty much where that spar is there. And that's not unusual for a manufacturer to put the center of gravity where the wing spar goes, but you do need to check with your instructions. Um, so what I do to check the center of gravity, it's quite nice that it's on that spar because it makes it quite easy for me, um, is you just hold it there with your fingertips and, and just see where you are. Now in this case, you can see that is pretty tail heavy. Um, so what I would do is to adjust that is I can move it in this case, the battery is going to have to probably go as far forward as I can get it. So put the battery right up there and now let's check the center of gravity. So it's still, still tail heavy. So that means that I'm going to have to add some weight into the front 
front of this. Um, so any, anything heavy that you can find, it could be some old money. Um, obviously, if you've got some proper weights you can put in here, you can buy weight from a model shop, that would be perfect. Um, the other thing I'm just going to do is I'll put the canopy on. I don't think that's going to make any difference. But it does all sort of add to it. So all we need to do is um, just have a play around basically until we get this right. So I've, I have actually got some weights here. So if I shove these up in the nose, just for now, and then shove my battery right the way up. Let's try that. There we go. Spot on, pretty much. So that's actually quite neutral. You might want it ever so slightly more nose heavy, but to be honest, I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. You can see now that the plane is balancing. It's not wanting to tip over to its tail. Um, so that for me is a nice neutral flying position and, and that's how you want to get yours. It's actually pretty critical that you follow this procedure, follow my instructions and make sure that you get the center of gravity right. Because if you have a, uh, the center of gravity wrong, uh, particularly if it's tail heavy, like this one was out of the box, um, that is going to cause you a problem. It's going to be very hard to fly uh, and you'll most likely crash it. So do take some time to make sure you've got the centre of gravity correct. And of course, the other thing to make sure, as I've showed you, is to make sure that you've got all your surfaces going in the right direction. That's an initial check here in the garage. Every time I fly this model, and I'll show you this in part three when we get down the flying field, every time I fly this model, I'm going to check to make sure that my surfaces are moving in the right direction. That, that's just something that you should get into your head. Every time you fly the model before you take off, make sure that your surfaces are moving in the right direction. Okay, so that's more or less it now. Um, we've got the receiver in. I haven't fastened the receiver in, but you would just stick the receiver in with Velcro. Uh, in an appropriate location. Same for the battery. You do get some Velcro in the kit, I think. I'm pretty sure they included it. Perhaps they didn't. Um, but um, just get yourself a strip of Velcro and you want to put that in the battery bay all the way down here. So so right the way there so you can, you can change the position of your battery and then stick the other side of the Velcro to your battery like I have here and then you can put that in there and that's going to keep your battery nice and tight because again you don't want the battery to move around in flight because if that battery slips back that's going to change the center of gravity mid-flight which again is going to cause a, a, a problem for you. Um, so last thing to, for us to do now really is um, just put the prop on and make sure that the, the motor's working, the prop's working in the right direction. Um, but in order to do that I am 100% going to be disconnecting the battery so there's absolutely no risk okay so there you go you heard my radio saying it's lost connection um, there's no risk of me throttling up while I'm trying to put the the uh, propeller on so and in fact they have included uh, the velcro so they've included two pieces uh, so one of those will be for the your receiver one will be for the ESC and then this longer one is for the battery so that's good that they've included that And in order to put the prop on, so they include a prop adapter. So we unscrew that. We're going to slip this onto the shaft of the motor, uh, and it's like a a clamp mechanism. So as you tighten this uh, little nose cone nut up, um, it's going to clamp that onto the motor as well. So. Hopefully you can still see this, yeah. So we're going to slide this on there. It's a nice, sort of fairly, should be a, a nice fit, shouldn't move around. Um, we're then going to get the motor on. Now I'm going to put this on so the letters on the prop are facing towards the front of the plane because it's a pusher, pusher prop. Uh, now, this is too loose, as you can see here. So that's that's not acceptable. We can't have the uh, sorry for bashing the camera. We can't have the propeller uh, on the motor 
you know where where it's moving around on the shaft like that that's gonna that's gonna be horrendous it's gonna cause a lot of vibration and basically just not be good so what we need to do included in the kit are some collars basically so you get these in the kit and these are going to be one of these is going to fit perfectly over the uh, over the shaft and it's it's that one there so that's a really nice tight fit there um, there's no slop in that so we're going to just take that one off we don't need any of the others so you could bin those uh, or just keep them as spares and then you'll see here on the propeller there's a, there's a uh, the hole there is enlarged so it allows us to put this collet in basically so we're just going to put that in there like that and now when we put the motor on that's going to be a nice tight secure fit onto the onto the shaft there so let's put that onto here and then all we're going to do is we're just going to fasten on this little nut so we just screw that on by hand and tighten it up and there's a hole in the end of the uh, little nose cone nut so you need to just get something in there like a small screwdriver or an allen key and that will enable you to tighten this up now it can be quite tricky because the motor will spin when you do this so you kind of need to hold the motor um, as well as tightening it up okay so let's try that So we're going to connect the battery back up. Now it's getting, you know, potential risk here because we've got the prop on. So make sure there's no one around, particularly uh, pets, little kids. Now what I've got set on my radio as well, and this is a really good idea for you to do the same, is I've got um, a throttle cut switch here. Um, so if I put the throttle up, it's actually not going to do anything because I've not uh, enabled my throttle cut. Again, this, this varies depending on the make of radio you've got, but most of them should allow you to set that. So when I flick that down now, that will now power the throttle. So let's see. So yeah, I've, uh, the propeller is on the right way. So as you can see there, the model wants to go forwards. So happy with that. I'm just going to tighten it up once more um, and uh, we should be good to go. Right then, um, I've disconnected the battery. I've just tightened the um, propeller up as much as I can now. Um, not done it, you know, completely super, super, super tight. I've just held, held the, uh, the motor there with my thumb and, and tightened it up so it is a nice, that's, that's not going to go anywhere, so that's fine. Um, if you find that uh, it really vibrates a lot, I mean this wasn't too bad, um, but if you find that when you put the prop on, because the props aren't really balanced that well sometimes, if you find it vibrates quite a lot, what you can do is you can loosen this off and you can try different positions of the propeller. So you start with it like that, you loosen it off and then you sort of, if you think about a clock, you turn the propeller say clockwise to 12 o'clock tighten it up, throttle it up, see whether that's any better, do the same for half, uh, quarter past, half past and, and go round the clock. You'll probably find one position where the, the uh, propeller motor are, are less noisy in that position and, and that means you've, it's kind of uh, balanced. So that's something that you might want to do and again it's not 100% necessary. So we are ready to fly. Um, so we've obviously put the model together we've connected up all the control surfaces to the control horns uh, we've installed our radio gear we've tested that all the surfaces are moving in the right direction we've tested that the motor is working and the propellers going in the right direction because as you saw the the model wanted to come towards me which is obviously what you want it to do 
Um, we've also crucially checked the center of gravity to make sure we've got that nice neutral slight nose heavy position. Um, that is about it. We are done. We are ready to fly this plane. So exciting times because if this is your first time flying a plane, then there's no more excuses now. It is ready to fly. So next job is to take it down to the field and we'll go through a few more checks down at the flying field. Um, and then we will make an attempt at our first ever flight. So that's going to be coming up in part three. Um, unfortunately, I can't do that and because we're in lockdown here in the UK. Um, so as soon as we're out of lockdown, this is probably going to be the first model that I take down to the field so that I can uh, get part three done for you. Um, hopefully you found this video useful. If you've got any questions, maybe you're building your own, you're following along with this video, then please feel free to put something in the comments and I will get back to you. Um, if you could give me a like, that would help me out a lot. And if you could subscribe, that would be really good. Um, if you do subscribe, then you can look forward to more content like this, more videos of me um, going through RC kit, building planes, electric, nitro, FPV, all that sort of stuff. So if you're into RC planes, then you want to subscribe to this video. It doesn't cost you a penny to subscribe. Um, it's completely free, although YouTube call it subscribe. It's actually like following someone on Facebook or LinkedIn or uh, Instagram or something like that. It's, it's, uh, it doesn't cost you anything. So that's part two done. Um, stay safe and I'll see you soon for part three down at the flying field.